Welcome to the Film Florida podcast. I'm John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Before we get to our interview, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the Film Florida podcast. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.23 for our 2023 fundraising campaign. We also have a Film Florida merchandise page. Visit filmflorida.creator-spring.com to purchase Film Florida t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, and more. Actress, writer, and producer Kelsey Scott is a graduate of Florida A&M University and Florida State University, best known for her roles on How to Get Away with Murder, 12 Years a Slave, and Fear, The Walking Dead, Passage. We talked to her about how she got into the entertainment industry, her various roles, her professional growth, a special performance she has coming up in Florida, her philanthropic efforts, and more on this episode of the Film Florida Podcast. Here's my conversation with Kelsey Scott. Thanks for being on the Film Florida Podcast with us, Kelsey. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start with the backstory. Tell us where you're from. I am from Atlanta, uh, born and bred, a Southern girl t- uh, to my soul. Kind of started out in this world very young. It started out public speaking. And that public speaking comes with a bit of a caveat because I wasn't really intending to do that. When I was six years old, my grandmother moved in with us after my grandfather passed and my grandmother loved to write. She was never able to do it as a profession, but it was her passion. And she brought that into the household. So there were days where she would write poetry and some prose. She loved to write inspirational speeches. So what she would do is teach those to me and for me, you know, I'm, uh, I think it was like five or six when she moved in. So she would teach that to me. And then I'd go out and say that at a church or say that at a community event. And then those appearances, those public speaking appearances at that age got bigger and broader and wider. And the audiences got a little more universal. And then one day somebody handed me a script and then public speaking morphed into acting. And that was kind of the, um, the catapult for me. Well, and you started early on, I think, in theater. So how did that kind of lay the foundation for the the bigger part of your career? Well, I stepped on stage again pretty young. And so mom was trying to, to guide that love that I instantly had for performing. And uh, so I started out the Alliance Theater and uh, their children's theater program. And I I never lost my love for theater. I think it'll always be my first love as far as performing is concerned. But I learned discipline as a performer in theater. You know, there is a uh, a very strong respect for the script in theater. You know, unlike mm-hmm. in film, less in television, but more in film, you can kind of change the words a little bit. You can play around. But in theater, you know, The play is the play. (laughs) The script is the script. And I think starting out in that place just gave me much more reverence for the word, especially because I was kind of coming from my grandmother and her love of words. And uh, theater teaches you to be on time because the show starts when the show starts. And so there was so much about structure that was even outside of the artistry that I learned by starting in the theater. So I've kept that going. That discipline follows me now to whatever I'm working on. And how did you go from theater to, I guess we'll call it, for lack of a better term, traditional acting? So my transition, again, happened when I was young, uh, but it was uh, a bit of luck. Actually, it was a lot of luck. (laughs) It was a lot of luck and timing. So when I was in elementary school, my mother was reading the newspaper one Sunday and saw that there were auditions for this competition being held by Showtime and the movie channel back when they were kind of like working together, back when there was a the movie channel. And um, they were looking for kids to host a week of family time programming on cable. So they were going to 36 malls around the country and then holding these open auditions where the hundreds of kids would show up, you'd go on stage, you'd read it from a cue card, you'd share a talent, and then they had uh, state winners. And then from those state winners, they pulled four national winners. So I was the Georgia winner, and then I was one of the four national winners, and they flew us all to New York, and they put our families up. It was all fancy with limos and that sort of thing, and um, and eating at fancy restaurants at Central Park. It was 
really, really um, outside of anything I had ever experienced. And one of the judges for that competition was Nancy Carson, who is a renowned children's agent, especially for kids on Broadway. And she came down to the taping and she spoke with my mom and asked her to bring me down to her office later on that day. And we went. She and Nancy had a conversation. They shook hands. And then I had an agent in New York. And <laughs> so Nancy started sending me out on auditions. And very soon, I auditioned for the Robert Guillaume show, which was a new sitcom. And I got the part. And then that was the leap from stage to television. Wow. And now you went to undergrad at FAMU in Tallahassee. And then you received your MFA from FSU, also in Tallahassee. Tell us about how you got from where you were in Atlanta down to those schools and then talk about how the universities prepared you for kind of your career. Well, I guess the first story is how I even got to FAMU. So by the time I was entering my senior year in high school, I was firmly entrenched in theater, anything performing, anything public speaking. I was, I was, that was my, my, my passion. So I initially did not want to go to college. I told my mom, I was like, you know, when I graduate, I want to move to New York and I want to take my shot at Broadway. And I'm a performer now, mom, like this is my thing. So my mom was an educator and she could not fathom <laughs> her daughter <laughs> not getting a degree so we made an agreement and the agreement was uh, that if I went to college and got a degree in something that was not artistic so that she felt like I had something to fall back on if this performing thing didn't work out, then after I graduated, anything I wanted to do, she's fully behind it and all gung ho. And so I said, uh, I said, okay, when I was looking at universities, I wanted to go somewhere that had a strength in journalism because at that point, writing was a passion for me as well. And I chose broadcast journalism because I figured, well, at least I'm kind of on camera. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the program at Florida A and M was just uh, was just stellar. I went to visit the campus and fell in love with. I fell in love with the faculty. I fell in love with the the student spirit. I fell in love with just the entire environment. And I was like, okay. If I'm going to spend four years someplace, this is the place. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I would not now give up what I received by way of education, relationships, uh, personal growth from family for anything. I'm so glad I made that deal with my mom. So after I graduated from fam, I thought, okay, all right, let's go out in the world and do the thing. Uh, I never thought I'd go back to school <laughs> because I was trying to not do it in the first place. But while I was at FAM, there were a couple of students who were making an independent film. So I ended up being cast in film. And I just was so curious about all the other things that were going on behind the camera. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, why, why is the camera running separately from the sound? And what is she writing in that notebook? And why do people keep asking her what to call the shot? And, and I just, <laughs> it was all like amazing to me. And so suddenly, Though I had done some things behind the scenes for theater, and I had actually done some things behind the thing behind the scenes for television. At that point, I ended up executive producing a television show while I was at FAM with one of my uh, freshman sisters. I had never gone behind the scenes for film, and now okay. I had a new curiosity. And so I started looking for film schools, and then found that one of the top film schools in the country was in the same city. <laughs> so I graduated from FAM, took a year off and was just acting mostly in theater and applying to film schools. And I ended up at Florida State. Again, I kind of lucked up into one of the places that would have a huge impact on my life in terms of relationships and people and faculty and then my career. So at this point, I was a fully rounded performer and filmmaker. At Florida State, you don't really uh, specify one track. Like it's it's not, oh, I'm going there to be a director. I'm going there to be a sound designer. You learn everything. So by the time it's over, you can do everything. You'll find out what your strength is and what you want to gravitate more toward, but you're gonna know how to do it all. And in terms of the impact on my life now, as an actor, I can edit my own reel. I understand everything that's going on in front of the camera and behind the camera. And so I think 
that experience starting from when I was small and learning the discipline on stage, going in front and behind the camera, I feel like it has made me the type of performer that respects everyone's job. I know how to do some of them. I respect all of them. And I think that helps both as, um, as, as someone who appreciates the people that come together to make the work that feeds into who you are, not just as a performer and not just as a writer, which is kind of the other half of my resume, but just as a person, <laughs> you know, you don't take anybody's job for granted. You know how long it takes to, I've, I've slept in the Pro Tools suite trying to get just the right ambient sound behind, a, you know, a shot. So I know not to speak over the actor. You don't have to tell me that in terms of, oh, I got to educate this actor, you might just have to remind me because I was so passionate in that moment, but I get it. And so I wouldn't trade where I was educated um, for both um, artistry and for life <laughs> yeah. um, at all. Well, and while you were at FSU, if I read this correctly, you won an award at the Palm Beach's Student Showcase of Films, which is how we kind of got to, to, to meet you. Do you remember much about that experience? I do. So uh, that award came for my thesis film, which is called The Bues. <laughs> and that film opened so many experiences. Florida State is really good about putting their films out into the festival circuit. And being a part of that, um, that kind of machinery as the festival circuit can be, uh, you just learn a lot. You meet a lot of people, you forge a lot of relationships, you get an understanding of, of the mechanics of the business of filmmaking, mm -hmm. uh, which you get some of in school, but really it's when you're kind of out in the big bad world. But this was um, kind of like a, um, a microcosm of that. And it got, gave me a glimpse into kind of what it's gonna be like to do some of the wheeling and dealing the views ended up being very successful on the festival circuit. And again, just experiences that you don't anticipate, but they end up having a really big impact on you. Yeah, yeah. Now, you were in productions like 12 Years a Slave and How to Get Away with Murder. What do you remember about getting those roles and being part of those you know, larger projects? So many stories. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's start with 12 Years of Slave since that one came first. So that one ended up being a lot of bet on yourself. So 12 Years of Slave came about shortly after my mother passed away. And I was just in a, I was in a state, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it happens and that and the, the grieving in the morning can just do all kinds of things to you. So that's where I was in kind of like a, 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 a dark place. Mm -hmm. And I got this audition um, and they wanted to do it as a local hire, uh, which means you kind of, um, you kind of put the bill to get yourself out there to do it. It's, a, it's different than somebody bling, bringing you in. Yep. And so I did the initial audition on tape and then they wanted the callback to be in person, which meant flying to New Orleans for a callback. And not only was I just still in, uh, the dark place. It was also a time where I was not in a great financial position either. And the idea of flying across the country for a, for a callback for an audition, not just, not even the part, but just for a callback, I wasn't sure if I could do it on so many levels. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, if I'm asking other people to take a chance on me, how can I request that and not take a chance on myself? So a lot of stuff went on my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> and I flew across the country for this maybe seven minute audition. And I didn't have enough money to stay overnight. So I was turning right back around and going to the airport because I'd used my rental car to change clothes. It was all of that stuff. Yeah. And I didn't really think I did well in the callback. I didn't feel good about it. So I had stopped at a restaurant to just kind of get some New Orleans grub before I had to leave the uh, the state. And my agent called and she said, go back. They want you to read for a larger role. Huh. I was like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> well, that must've gone better than I thought it had. <laughs> 
Um, so I turned around and that was a, a domino effect of many, many more things with much, much more on my credit card. But ultimately what I realized that day and what I realized since is that the times that my life and, and or my career have seen the largest growth is when I have taken a risk, mm. when I have just jumped and believed that I will spread wings. <laughs> and that's that's when I've seen the gold. And that's what happened for 12 Years a Slave. I mean, who knew what it would become? Right. <laughs> you know, the people I'd get a chance to work with. I mean, I stood on the Oscar stage when we received the Academy Award. I had no idea when I was changing clothes in my car for the callback <laughs> that I could end up, you know, standing next to Brad Pitt and and Will Smith announced it and Ellen DeGeneres was hosting and like, the, you know, and among these amazing filmmakers and artists. So some of that is a story, <laughs> but that's, a, but 12 Years of Slave was just an experience. And there was so much in doing it as well there were so many times that i called upon my mother to sit upon my shoulder when i was portraying this character this woman who had no idea where her husband was for 12 years mm -hmm. um, but had her own sort of faith and fell and kept the family together in this in this absence that she couldn't even identify and so oh there's so much about that project but suffice it to say it was a, a big part of my life and a big part of my career in a time where i needed the light of art to bring me out of a place for how to get away with murder <laughs> i bet you didn't <laughs> think these stories were going to be this long <laughs> um for how to get we, away with we murder. love stories good good because i've got so many of them <laughs> um oddly enough Another dark time, you picked just the right projects for stories. But I I was kind of at the point where I wasn't sure whether I was gonna stay in Los Angeles anymore. Mm -hmm. It had just been a dry spell and things weren't happening for me. And I got this audition and uh, there are some people who are very good at bringing up tears. I'll just say it that way. Um, mm -hmm. Or uh, I, can give you, I can give you all of what makes a person cry or actually what makes a person try to stop themselves from crying which i think is stronger but but sometimes that specific physical manifestation of tears is more difficult for me because i as a person tend to shut off when i feel those emotions and mm. so i'm kind of battling my natural instinct to be able to emote in that visible way in terms of tears all that to say we get to the audition and this the scene that we're given to audition with is like immediately she's crying and i'm like okay so we're just gonna start with crying we're not even gonna build our way up what you action and cry and so <laughs> <laughs> that took a lot from me and again i turned to at this point my mother's spirit and just ask her to help me to make myself publicly vulnerable in a way that I normally don't because I needed her assistance. Mm -hmm. And so I walked in that room a very different actor than I normally am. I, you know, because of the role, they don't want you to have any makeup on or anything like that. So that was great because I got in and I was, I was listening to the casting directors, but I was kind of pacing. I was a, I was a tiny bit mad, um, but, but I did the audition. I took the redirect. And when I left the audition, I had pulled up so much stuff from myself that I couldn't turn it off. And yeah. I got in the car and I was bawling, just inconsolable. And I was actually a little concerned because I felt like as much as I wanted to release that emotion, I felt like maybe I was a little untethered. Maybe I went a little too much over the edge. And I called a friend of mine who's also an actor and he talked me down for 15 minutes so that I could drive. And mm -hmm. so that time, much like 12 Years a Slave, I thought there's no way I got this because I don't even know, I'm trying to figure out who I am right now. Who knows what I was in that room. Right. And yet again, that was uh, either that's what they were looking for or that's what they decided they wanted after they saw it. And um, 
and then that was that whole experience working with Viola, um, having multiple episodes to be able to round out and develop a character as opposed to yeah. kind of a one-off was, uh, was pivotal for me as a, as a performer. And, um, it's definitely one of my favorite roles. Now, in addition to those, I mean, speaking of some of the one-offs, I mean, you've been in some great series like Insecure, NCIS, Grey's Anatomy, True Detective. Do you have a favorite or interesting experience worth sharing from any of those productions? I'll tell you a funny one since we've been doing this dark place. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for NCIS, uh, we shot at Cafe du Monde. And if you're familiar with it, you know they're famous for their beignets and they're famous for their coffee. And the cafe is always packed and always loud with, you know, regulars and tourists and, you know, right in the middle of the French Quarter. And so I'm doing a scene with Lucas Black and we're sitting across the table from each other. And they haven't closed the restaurant because they they just can't. There's no way in the world. So right. they, they just kind of sectioned off a bit for us to shoot in. And then there's like a tarp in between us and the regular customers. And then on our side are background actors and us. It was so loud that I couldn't hear Lucas speaking. The ah. only way I knew it was time to speak is that his lips stopped moving. And I was like, I guess it's now my line <laughs> because I cannot hear a word he is saying. And I thought to myself, oh, we are definitely going to have to ADR this. We're definitely going to have to go inside a studio and figure this out because there's no way in the world they're going to be able to block out all of this noise. And somehow they did. We did not. We wow. did ADR for like another section, <laughs> but we didn't have to do it for that. But that was just fun. It was fun. I didn't, at that point, I'd worked in New Orleans a few different times and I loved going there. I loved working there. And that was just a very different experience and very cool and fun. Speaking of that, just uh, off topic a little bit, do you prefer working in a controlled environment, like on a soundstage, or do you prefer to be out and about kind of with the people? That's so there's a, di there's a different question. vibe, right? There's a different vibe to either. Wow. And I've never been asked that question. I, I'm not sure that there's a favorite. And I think it might have to do with the character, the scene, like what's going on. I tend to get hot. So if I have on a lot of clothing, I'd rather be on a soundstage where it's cool. Sure. <laughs> but Because um, that was something that happened with 12 Years a Slave too. We had on so much clothing and we were doing primarily exterior shots in New Orleans in the summer. So uh, that took a lot of just, <laughs> just thinking about icebergs so that you were <laughs> melting on camera. But um, but no, I think I, I enjoy both both for different reasons, but you're right. There is a, a very different vibe from kind of being out in the world and being on a soundstage. Yeah. Now you were nominated for a primetime Emmy for your role as Sierra in Fear of the Walking Dead Passage. Give us yes. a story about getting the role and then just, you know, that production in general. Getting the role was funny because we didn't know what we were auditioning for. Mm. So I initially got the audition for Fear the Walking Dead from my commercial agent. And they gave us kind of these dummy sides because they didn't want to tell us what we were auditioning for. And so I was thinking, what kind of commercial is this? Is this a PSA? <laughs> like, you know, they had us like in, in a, an encampment somewhere and it was this really kind of dark dialogue. And I was like, commercials aren't generally dark. Anyway, I had no idea what I was auditioning for. And I did the audition. I did the callback, had a great rapport with the director doing the callback. All of that was a lot of fun. I left the audition. My agent calls and she says, you got it. I was like, great. What is it? <laughs> and she said I don't know but you got it <laughs> so it wasn't until I got the phone call from the costume department that I knew what I booked so funny getting into that but once we got on set oh my gosh how much fun I had I had been saying and so perhaps I manifested this a bit that I'd wanted to do an action role I wanted to do something where my makeup didn't have to be perfect and I could get hot and sweaty and you know mm -hmm. wield weapons and this was perfect for that and so much so that Michelle Prada who is um, the co-star in that we uh we were working together and having so much fun with all the physicality that even though they provided us with stunt doubles, we ended up not using the stunt doubles because we wanted to do all the stuff. So okay. we were falling in dirt and running into things that, it, I mean, we shot like in a cave. It was, it was crazy and it was 
beautiful. <laughs> we had such a great time. Yeah. Wow. And now, I mean, in addition to all of the acting stuff, which we could go on for hours, you have a good amount of writing and producing credits. What's your approach to storytelling from that side of that, that perspective? So from that perspective, I have fun creating worlds. Hmm. On the performer side, I have fun playing make-believe. <laughs> On the writing side and the producing side, I have fun having the ability to pull something out of my head and then see it become something tangible. The first time it kind of hit me, I wrote this film um, called Motives. And in the script, I made up the name of this company. You know, it was hmm. the, she needed to have a, a corporate presence. And so I, you know, made up a name. And so I was able to be on set while they were filming. And so one day I'm on set, we're doing the scene at the corporation and the production designer is putting in place the sign for the company. And it hit me in that moment, you created that. Like hmm. that company doesn't exist somewhere in the world. Like that's a, a world that you made happen. And it was such a, a high, it was such a, it felt like such a responsibility. So for me, on the performing side, I think my responsibility is to bring to life what the writer envisioned and what the director molded. And on the writing and producing side, it is to create worlds for characters to exist in, to breathe in and that is a that's a really great feeling that is pretty cool that's very cool and, and now you know going back to you know some of your other work you received a daytime emmy nomination for outstanding guest performer in a digital daytime drama series called giants can you speak to the idea of actors becoming producers and creating content to showcase both their talents and the talents of those around them i mean in in that case james bland did that here but it seems like you do a little bit of that same that same stuff. I do, I do. And I think kind of like the well-rounded thing, well, it does two things. Um, one, you get to create from all angles. Mm -hmm. And two, nowadays there's so much content and there are so many distribution streams that making your mark being visible, being seen, being able to do something. It's, it seems like there'd be a trillion opportunities and, and so everybody would get a chance, but it's a little different than that. I find that actually it's a little more narrow. So if you mm. create the lane for yourself, then you're not asking somebody to approve of you. You know, you're not saying, please like me, put me in your project, <laughs> which is what we spend a lot of our time doing. And because so many people are in line for that, the line is really, really long. So if you want to make space for yourself, then part of it might be creating that world and then putting on a producer hat and showing that world to the world so they can then say, oh, you know what? You're right. I think, mm. I think so-and-so does have something to offer. And I, I never would have picked up their resume, but I'm so glad you showed me what they could do. And so for James Bland, another fam Ewan, he wanted to create a lane for himself as an actor. And then there were people that he wanted to work with whose talent that he appreciated and lauded, but was not either wasn't seeing them get that type of recognition in the industry or the type of recognition that he thought they deserved. And so yeah. he pulled them into this project and said, hey, I got this lane. Do you guys want to follow it with me? And so um, I was very fortunate to receive such an invitation from him. Yeah, that is really cool. Um, in addition to these projects, you've worked on some really impactful short films. And you know, going all the way back to your career, that's how you started. The one that kind of jumped out at me was Mama, I Want to March. Can you talk a bit more about your experience in short films versus other stuff? Yes, I think that my appreciation for short films came from Florida State. I can't say that I had much of um, 
a knowledge of them beforehand. And maybe, you know, that was a timing thing. Maybe they, you know, became more prevalent around the time that, uh, that I was in film school, but I think they had been around, but I just wasn't aware of them. Mm -hmm. um, but because we produced shorts at Florida State, um, I could see one, it's a very particular skill set. Because if you're making a feature, you have time. <laughs> you have time for the setup and you have time to develop the character and you have uh, you have time to let it be a slow burn if you want to. But in a short, you have to get in there and you have to hit it and you have to make it happen and it has to be over in 20 minutes. <laughs> and someone right. has to feel like they've seen a complete story. And so yep. that for me is like a bit of a boot camp. I think if you can make an impactful short film, then you're a beast. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you, you, there should be nothing that can stop you because if you can do it in 20 minutes and somebody gives you 80, well, that's that's just playing around. That's playground there. Right, so right. I think that short films are a great training ground for filmmakers. And they're also a really great place um, to experiment and to to delve into something that uh, somebody else might not see the value of as a feature, but if you put it in a short and you show them how it can work, that's why you see a lot of short films that then become features, um, yeah. because it might have been very difficult to get someone to put their money behind that concept um, in a feature length way. But once they saw, oh wait, this could actually work, then it becomes uh, then it becomes a stepping stone for a longer format. But for me, again. I was introduced to them in film school. And so then I just had an affinity for them because uh, mm. I realized how difficult they actually are to make and uh, how how impactful they can be. So for Mama, I Wanna March, that actually was an invitation to come back to act in one of the shorts at Florida State um, mm -hmm. long after I graduated and I was you know living out here as an actress. And I said, of course I will come back. I mean, first you're talking about my alma mater, then you're talking about a format that I appreciate and love. And then it was an opportunity to be a part of the growth of young filmmakers. So all of that just worked for me. And so uh, that's one of several shorts that I've been a part of as an actor for many reasons. Now, I mean, we've talked about shorts, we talk about some TV series, we talk about theater, we talk about <laughs> uh, films. I mean, we, we haven't necessarily talked about music videos or video games or anything like that, but do you have a preferred genre of storytelling? Where, where do you prefer to be? Oh, that is so tough. I think that theater is always going to be my first love. Um, Cause that's where I started. Yeah. Uh, also theater has its own special appeal because there's the immediacy of it, you know, yeah. for, for film and television, you know, you do it and then it's edited and then it's sound designed and then there's cut and cut and cut and then it's released. And then maybe somewhere down the line, there's a critic that you hear, you know, or, or somebody's online, but uh -huh. in theater, in theater, right there on the stage, you could feel the audience, you know, yeah. if they're with you, if they're not at the end, you know, whether or not they're, they're sitting and, and tapping their hands or they're on their feet, like there, and there's just a, there's something about the show must go on. There's something about being able to do something over and over again and finding something new every night. So yeah, I think theater is always going to be my first love. I still have not done Broadway and I'm so ready and so want to. Um, and then after that, you've got the film and television, um, right. which again, has its own appeal. But uh, but I think if, you, if I had to say my favorite, then I'm probably gonna say theater. Oh, that's cool. Now, you've mentioned Tallahassee a number of times uh, throughout this interview, and I know you have something really special coming up in Tallahassee. What is that? Tell us about it. So I have been invited back to Tallahassee by the Southern Shakespeare Company to play Cleopatra in their production of Antony and Cleopatra, and that will be Mother's Day weekend 2023. Wow, that's pretty cool. It'll, it'll be nice to kind of come full circle on some things. It will, and to be there through theater. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now you have uh, work with a, a bunch of different nonprofits. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the organizations you're involved with? Yes. I firmly believe in the power of art to heal, to evolve, to 
challenge. Um, and so whenever I come across an organization that I think is has found a way to use art as as the tool um, that it can be for personal growth, then I, I generally gravitate toward it. So uh, there are a few organizations that I work with. The first is Kids in the Spotlight. And so this organization enlists the help of professional filmmakers to help foster care youth tell their stories through short films. So mm. um, we help them direct and write and they act in and sometimes they get a chance to get behind the camera to be in post-production and I originally was just a fan of the organization and then through my work with them became an ambassador so I am always talking about them I'm always talking about how amazing they are and how they go into these foster care facilities inside of California and they provide a lifeline for these kids who sometimes can't sit and talk to you about the trauma they've, they've experienced or mm -hmm. the dreams that they have that they think can't come to fruition because of where they are in life. And then they walk into these rooms with these people who say, but here's a vehicle for you to express yourself, um, whether it's from the dark place or um, the place that you see light emanating from. And let me show you how to tell the world. And this organization is 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 priceless, and so I uh, am a, a, an emphatic <laughs> and passionate ambassador for them, and love the work that they do. Similarly, I work with an organization called Right Girl. Um, that's W R I T E, <laughs> and uh, and it's a mentorship program uh, for creative writing. And so wow. they um, they reach out to professional women writers and pair us with teenage girls, and we help them find their voices. And there are some very notable alum from the program, Amanda Gorman, our Youth Poet Laureate, uh, came mm -hmm. through the program. And so year after year, you just see these young ladies not only figure out what they want to say, but help them to say it in the way that is um, most authentic to them. And that's that's empowering. That's what, that's, that's what we should all be doing, making sure that our true voices are heard. And so I love working with them. Most recently, I paired with an organization called Cinnamon Girl, and uh, this is a leadership development organization. So um, in many different areas, again, it's mentors and uh, reaching out to these young ladies to show them what the world looks like beyond their block, beyond their city, mm -hmm. <laughs> beyond their state. And, uh, and I specifically work with the writing program. And again, it is about using words to explore the world and to create worlds so those are those are the organizations that are closest to my heart though not the only ones i work with yeah those those sound great now in addition to your nonprofit work you've also given back to creators through teaching and providing writing seminars what's the best piece of advice you have for those that are just setting out in the industry and want to follow your path Oh my gosh, my path. <laughs> it has taken so many turns and twists. I don't know about my path, but I'll tell you what I tell every screenwriter that I work with. Finish the script. Here's why I say that. Especially when you're starting out, you usually have this great big idea that's been, you know, like knocking on your door at night and shaking you awake and saying, don't ignore me. And you get in there and you start writing. And at some point, you get stuck mm -hmm. and you might not find it easy to find your way out. And it might seem like, you know what? That must not have been the idea. That probably wasn't what I thought it was. I, I'm just gonna put that one to the side and I'm gonna do this other thing. And before long, you'll have a whole lot of half written, quarter written, three quarter written scripts. Mm -hmm. And you might be right that that first idea wasn't the thing. It's probably not something that's going to be in, in theaters near you, but you have to finish it because if you want to be a writer, then you have to go from beginning to end and then you have to rewrite and then rewrite and then rewrite. So until you get to about the fifth rewrite, don't decide that wasn't the story. It just, you just might not know how to tell it yet. So it's really important to finish the script, even if you're not sure 
that it is ultimately going to be the thing that puts you on the map because if that's not the project, you're still a better writer for having written. For acting, oh my gosh, stay in the game. It's a long game. Yeah. And <laughs> and we'll hear lots of stories about people who got discovered in bank lines, <laughs> but that's not the norm. The right. norm is day after day, month after month, year after year, um, studying your craft because it is a craft, you know, um, it is a skill set. And if you would train to be an athlete, you should train to be an actor and yep. keep doing it. So you can't dance if you're not at the party. So <laughs> stay in the game. Yeah. I love both of those pieces of advice. I, I love the writing advice because even if I mean, like, I'm nowhere near the level of you, but I mean, I we still get people that ask us, and and I always tell people that if you want to be a writer, then you have to write. If you want to be an actor, you have to act. And and on the writing side, even if your writing isn't good, it's still part of the process of getting to be a good writer. And you don't you don't just wake up one day and become a good writer. You get good by practicing your craft. So I love, I love that advice. Um, in other interviews that I've seen of you, you've talked about asking for forgiveness rather than permission. How has that mantra kind of guided you through your career? Sometimes I have to remind myself, this profession, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera, is so much about being validated by other people mm. so that you can eat. <laughs> so that you can pay your bills you know that's a that's a that's a tough road most times if you go to work and you do your job that's enough right but sometimes here no actually people have to like you too or yeah. you know or you have to be in a position where uh that's not uh, that's not a necessity anymore but that's a whole other level and so right. you could get into a place where you kind of toe the line you you work so hard to be liked that you forget to be yourself. And ultimately, being specific and unique is what makes you indispensable. So sometimes I just have to remember, do it because it's authentic and it makes sense and it's a risk and it is serving the art. And that sometimes follows the rules and sometimes it doesn't. But if all of those boxes are checked and I do it and I get in trouble for it, <laughs> then I'll ask your forgiveness, but you might like what you got. It wasn't in the package that you thought it was gonna come in, but I would rather say, forgive me for doing that than come from this other place, which actually kind of lessens my contribution. It lessens it lessens me actually yeah. because I'm I'm saying please sir I want some more that's not right. how that's not how I want to live and that's not how I want to create art yeah that makes sense now where can people keep up with everything you're doing you know like tell us where we can find more about you okay uh, um the uh the kind of one-stop shop would be my website which is kelseyscott.com uh but you can find me on social media twitter instagram um at ms Kelsey Scott, MS Kelsey Scott, and Facebook, just my name, <laughs> you know, um, and I'm, I'm pretty much uh, uh, an open book, so I don't have like a professional Facebook page, it's just me, uh -huh. um, yeah. you know, let's talk about it. <laughs> and outside of your event in Tallahassee, where can people find you next? That, uh, at the moment, that is where you can find me next in front of an audience. I have uh, multiple projects going on behind the scenes as a writer and producer. So I'm developing um, uh, a, a series uh, um, and two films, actually. I have, to, I have to think about it. I have to count those. So uh, I'm always working on creating some kind of world, either, you know, by someone else's direction or by, uh, by my own keyboard. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, Kelsey, I know that you are really busy. I <laughs> sincerely appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Your stories were tremendous. I really enjoyed them. And thanks for being on the Film Florida podcast with us. Oh, thank you. This was a joy. I appreciate the invitation. Thanks for listening to the Film Florida podcast. 
For more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org or visit our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.23 for our 2023 fundraising campaign. Check out the Film Florida merchandise at filmflorida.creator-spring.com. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast.